When I was asked to speak about, uh, to come and participate in this and speak a little bit about our uh, farm's involvement with your regenerative organic certification, I thought it was a, an interesting fit because I think often when we s hear about some of the emerging ideas or many of the concepts you would have heard from some different speakers over the course of these few days here about integrating regenerative practices onto our organic operations, one could lead to the thought, well, wow, it's a fine idea. I'm sure it would work down in Pennsylvania. It would work in California, but it's never going to work here in Saskatchewan or Manitoba or Alberta. And I thought this was a good opportunity to say, yes, no, sir, not only can it work here, it is being worked, it is starting to be implemented here. I by no means am an expert on this topic. That is a far stretch to be uh, to on there. We are learning along this way. We're learning in terms of if the regenerative organic certification program has been well designed for our region or if some of the goals I that is involved in it are the right goals. And I think if we think back to the organic certification process as being uh, constantly evolving, when we look towards some food safety practices on the farm as being perpetual improvement, that's where I really start to look at some of these, that we are not resolving the issue by any means, but we're learning and adapting. And I think that's uh, something that we all do as farmers and operators and ranchers. Um, now we're just required to do it. Uh, one of the photos that's, uh, that's in there, there's actually, uh, I thought it was very um, appropriate. I didn't realize the um, part of Michael's uh, interest and passion regarding um, farmer held seeds is actually, it's uh, the organic oat variety, Oravina, uh, that we were doing some seed multiplication on this year. So if, to think a little bit about, I mean, this is just a pilot, uh, but uh, we're trying to end up finding, I guess, the Regenerative Organic Certification Program was looking for participants from a wide range of different sorts of farms and a wide range of different mm, end users who were uh, finished good manufacturers. So it's a pretty diverse mix of per pilot participants and a diverse region really around the world uh, in terms of participants. Uh, our farm here in Saskatchewan is the, the only Canadian farm um, but there are pilot participants, as one can see here, um, throughout many different continents and countries around the world. And really, the program was designed to include any number of organic commodities. So that's why there's even cotton and palm oil, um, wine and fruits and vegetables and livestock and everything in between. I've always viewed as organic as being, in many ways, when we go through the inspection and you get the, maybe you get a few corrective actions, and then you get your stamp of approval, you get your certificate. It's really just this sort of, in a way, just a pass-fail process. And there's really a broad continuum. In the process of my inspection, I found that there was this wide range, um, as Marley in indicated in my introduction, between just barely meeting the standards to farmers who've really incorporated the big picture concepts that are written into the organic standards, that are far more than just, well, 36 months without any prohibited products, that are trying to promote and maintain and improve biodiversity, that are trying to improve water quality, that are trying to build soil health, that are really getting into some of these bigger concepts that aren't really assessed in a three-hour on-site inspection, and maybe you're not even recognized for all of going above and beyond. You do it for your own reasons on your farm. Maybe you're passionate about songbirds. So to you, you enjoy going for that walk on an early morning and seeing that all of the different birds that are on your operation doesn't get marketed to the consumers as such, but you gain your own internal pleasure. And obviously that's enough of a motivation to do that. The interesting thing I find with the regenerative organic certification program is it is leveled into, the, has some basic absolute requirements. I would call them in like similar to the organic standards, the must. You must be certified organic, period. You must, if you've got livestock, have an animal husbandry or animal welfare program that is audited in place. You must uh, have a social justice component on your farm. But within those musts, 
there is a variety of achievements. So, hence the bronze, silver, and gold level uh, of certification. And in order to uh, even reach the, you know, the gold standards, um, you will have to go through a number of steps to do this. It becomes increasingly more difficult to reach gold level as compared to bronze. Um, we'll see. We'll see how the program works and how it adapts here. When I look to some of the goals that they have written into it, I looked at the gold standard and I said, ooh, that's going to be a tall order to achieve that here in the Canadian prairies. That's going to be a tall order to achieve that on our farm. Will we be able to? I mean, obviously, that's where I want to go to. I don't know if it will be possible, uh, but we're certainly going to try. We're really going to try to get there. And maybe that, as part of a pilot participant, will be part of the learning lesson for ourselves and for the program creators. If you're going to roll out a program that is going to be adaptable from is equally adaptable in Vietnam coconut production as it is in Saskatchewan wheat production, as it is to Arkansas of beef production, that's addressing some pretty diverse operations in diverse parts of the world. So flexibility will have to be worked in. Um, as was kind of mentioned, there are some basic pillars that focus that these were the things that the ROC program really delves into and goes beyond um, sort of where the organic standards left off. Sure, the Canadian organic standards say that it's you as operators are to promote, to minimize soil disturbance, to promote, maintain, and improve soil fertility. I'm pretty sure there's rarely been a farmer who's ever got a non-compliance for tilling their summer fallow too often. We've kind of, in that through this process, you know, really said, well, you're not, you know, you're doing the right things towards soil health. Well, now these are absolutely required and baked in, and they are given measured goals that at a bronze level, you must have a cover crop at least once a year. To achieve the gold one, you got to have two per year. And as I said to them in this process, you have a very tight window between the last frost and the first frost. And I have seen some organic operations here in the Canadian prairies who have two cover crops per year. They started their season with a cool season cover crop. They worked that in. Then they got right on it and put in a warm season polyculture mix. And then the same operation managed to put in a third cover crop where they put in some cereals to retain all the nutrients. But they had no cash crop. It was just a year of intense soil building, three cover crops or two cover crops and one catch crop just to really build their soil in a serious way. Hmm. So I say to them, to do two annual cover crops could be nigh on to impossible. As I watched my first frost hit the farm on September 4th, we were halfway, we weren't even halfway through harvest before that frost came. How was I really going to factor in a cover crop at this point. Anyways, we'll learn. Not going to, it's a goal. It is a goal and we'll see. Similarly, if we move from a bronze, we have to have a three-year crop rotation. Same crop, not on the soil for, you know, the same piece of land for at least three years. Reaching the gold standard, you're up to a seven-year rotation. So these are the right goals and now we'll, we'll try to move, move through there. Oh, tillage. I had an interesting comment from somebody yesterday said, you know, all these discussions here just make me want to go home and go till something. Just want to go get on my tractor and go home and go till something. And I understand that concept. I looked at some of the fields that they didn't till at the farm last year and I'm like, oh, the Canadian thistle, the quack grass, why didn't you till it last fall when you had a chance? I know your goal was to minimize soil disturbance, but really? that field you didn't. So I've tried to actually minimize, I've had brought in some strategic tillage. That field definitely got tilled right after harvest this year and shall be tilled again. But other fields I'm looking to see, can I minimize the tillage operations? Can I maybe stretch out a longer period where we go between those soil disturbance events? Will we remove tillage in organic systems? I don't think so. Will we remove tillage? Can we reduce it more than we are currently using it? Yes, and I think we need to. 
Uh, we need to, as part of that process for uh, promoting soil biology, we need to address that for promoting soil health. Um, so they really, they work forward in some of these, um, say even for example with the uh, pesticides and uh, GMOs. They further define some of the, in the U.S. program as to, there's a really good organization in the U.S. called the Xerxes Society that works towards pollinator promotion. So they actually said, all right, well here's all the permitted organic pesticides, but you know, this one, this one, and this one are really actually bad for pollinators. So under the program, we're not allowed to use them on the operation. If they're prohibited under the Xerxes list of, of um, pesticides, now granted, most grain farmers, most organic operators here are really pretty limited in their input use, so it may be no impact. For others, perhaps, you know, on some of the market garden side, it will be a bit of an impact. One of the interesting things has been really the fact that they are requiring that we move forward in soil health doing that without quantifying how that is achieved, how do you know you're, uh, you're actually getting the goals? So we must implement soil testing across all of the fields and not just some basic NPK testing, but measures of real soil health. So, and that's to be done at a base level across all of the acres to give us our baseline and then also in future years to see are we doing, are we achieving the goals that we want? Are we building soil carbon levels? Are we improving microbial respiration? Are we getting the goals that we want? Uh, so we'll definitely implement out some soil testing. One of the other areas I think that it really goes into and I find very, has sometimes not adequately addressed in our current organic framework is promotion of biodiversity. So again, there's restrictions on um, sort of disruption to riparian areas. Maybe I ain't gonna draw, drain that slough like I'd been thinking about. Maybe I'll now actually try to establish some more grassed waterways to try and clean the water that's flowing into the Assiniboine River Valley that we farm above. Uh, one of the requirements are you can't have any extractive industry. So it's gonna impact some of those farms who've got you know uh, oil and gas wells on you know on their farms. That's not allowed under the program. No fracking, no oil and gas extraction, no mining. Uh, you have to promote and improve, you know, uh, endangered species and try to limit invasive species. And right now, um, they have uh, an option for greenhouse gas assessment on the farms. I won't be surprised as we move forward if that's something that they start to look more. How do we as a farm both limit our greenhouse gas emissions and improve our soil carbon sequestration? Uh, these are things that may be coming down the line for farm operations anyways. We're just we're gonna be one step ahead of the curve uh, through this program. We're, we don't have any animals, and I know some people have said, well, how can you be regenerative if you don't got any animals? That's one of the core pillars of regenerative agriculture is integration of animals. To which I say, yeah, it would be really good to have some livestock, uh, but we're not there yet. Maybe we'll create some partnerships, um, as Tanis pointed out, we're in their farm trying to work with some of our neighbors to incorporate those in. So I'll, I'll speak briefly about it, but it's not something we can still be ROC certified without having animals. We just don't have to have an animal welfare program. When I looked at the animal welfare side of things, the Canadian Organic Standard really addresses many of the issues that, that were worked into the regenerative organic certification. The ROC really addresses the failure of the U.S. National Organic Program to adopt all of the recommendations that were sitting in the docket before the last election and then fell by the wayside. That the industry had fought and really worked to address the concerns where you have these organic chicken farms where the birds have a goofy little four foot by eight foot penned in outdoor access. Yeah, well that's not allowed under the Canadian system. We're, we're, we have clear regulations on animal access to the outside that we have to give consideration to use of, of um, pain medications or analgesics, you know, all of those things are in there. But they do go above and beyond both the Canadian system and well above the US system. One of the other areas that's in there, and it was one that I've really kind of grappled with within our own operation, is part of the social fairness. So it is a requirement for any operation that you have to have a third party social justice um, or social fairness audit on your farm. It 
did make me think about things as I read through the standards. We don't have one yet. Um, we'll figure it out for next year. Uh, we don't have a lot of employees. To me, I kind of looked at this and said, wow, this would be great if we were a broccoli farm in the Salinas Valley of California with undocumented labor. But we don't. We're paying a really fair wage to all of our farm operators, else we wouldn't have any staff working at the farm. It's competitive to try and find any help in Saskatchewan. You gotta pay people a fair wage to get good help. Uh, so, but it did make me think about things. Uh, it made me think about the 17-year-old I had working for me in seeding season, and it was exam time, and it made me think, no, my farm, as much as I need to get all the seeding done, it shouldn't impede his education. No, I told him, go home, study for your exams. The crops will still be here, the farm will still be here, your exams are just now, so no, if I'm hiring a youth who's still in school, okay, you gotta start thinking about these things. Um, we'll see how this works, Yeah, I think it is, uh, will be, Many farms here uh, who had been working with one of the Saskatchewan buyers who had a requirement for social justice audits as part of those, if you wanted to be part of the cooperative, may be familiar with these, uh, this concept and others not so much. What I think the important part is, is that through this process of our farm getting involved in the regenerative organic certification that we start looking to continue to move forward, continue to innovate, and continue to grow and adapt. Because otherwise, I think we will find consumer confidence in the organic label may start to get eroded for all of the reasons that Michael pointed out. So it is important that we start staying ahead of the curve and continuing to learn and continuing to grow, uh, grow on our farms and grow on our ranches. And that's what gets me excited about the program. So we do have uh, a few minutes for any for a couple of questions, if there are any questions for either Michael or Stuart. And thank you to both of you for your presentations. Don't be shy. All quiet. Anyone? Oh, there. Sure. Oh, um, north uh, around, oh, uh, around the Yorkton area, so east central Saskatchewan, near Kamsack. I'm gonna find you. <laughs> so, Stuart, um, it, Andy Hammermeister, I'll you. <laughs> uh, we're undergoing standards, organic standards review right now, and uh, we have opportunities to propose revisions to the organic standards in Canada. And uh, I, I guess I'm just, uh, you know, we always have this, uh, in the marketplace, we're gonna create more confusion when we add more labels, right? And that's what one of the big concerns that always gets expressed. And so I guess I'm just wondering why, you know, if these are the desired outcomes of organic agriculture that we're trying to achieve, um, why don't we just work towards incorporating these into our standards that we have right now, rather than pursuing another certification system? Label fatigue is definitely a reality and, uh, and obviously becomes somewhat confusing. And this is uh, to, to a consumer who is looking to buy food that fits with their values and supports farmers that are doing the things that they want to see implemented. I guess it, it is a, if one had confidence, I guess when I think to this program and both its participation in a, at a global level, I think it results because there was lack of confidence that their regulatory change would get implemented. I perhaps view it under Canadian context, if we really felt that promotion of soil health required greater emphasis, we already have it into our standards. We already have the mechanism that is there. It, I don't know. I honestly don't know the, the answer yeah, to that one, I Andy. Uh, yeah. So I might too late well, and let Mike. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would just add to that to say that uh, I think our intention in the beginning was that we would create this baseline of standards that were sufficient and solid and that we would innovate in the marketplace and on the farms and eventually they would raise the standards within the federal system because we would be able to test them out in the countryside and perfect them, which is how we did in the first place. We didn't start with zero standards. We already had fa farmers out there doing things. Those were the ones we took. We went around and met those farms and said, how are you doing it, and wrote it into a standard. We didn't just make it up. 
So I think the same idea can apply here. If Canada can go ahead and put all these in place in within your standard, I say go for it. I say if you need to develop time in the marketplace to perfect those standards before you adopt it, do that as well. Mm. We, it has to continue to be quality improvement over time. Mm. There are some countries that are adding these, and in Europe, for, for instance, many certifiers already add additional standards beyond what the EU allows or requires. And so then the farmer shops by certifier and market as to which those additional criteria they need for their market. So I think we can have a little of both. We've been always worried about consumer confusion. When we first started trying to figure out about the social standard, we went around the world to interview farmers, and I'll never forget going to this Costa Rican farmer, and he said, well, you know, I'm bird-friendly, shade-grown, fair trade, organic. Can't you people go home and just give us one inspector and give us multiple claims. That has always been our market goal. We would like to be able to incorporate them and do that in a way that is holistic and give, gives you what you need as a farmer to get access to your market. That, that to me is the holy grail, but in the meantime, we're going to have to wrestle with these pieces and find how to get them in. If Canada can do it, I wish you would. It would put pressure on the EU and the U.S., and that would be a good thing. Mm. And I just wanted to say something. Yesterday morning, we had a, an exhibitor-sponsored breakfast, and Laura Telford gave a presentation on value-added processing in Canada. And one of the interesting things I took away from that presentation was that um, when she was talking to food manufacturers, they said that from their perspective, it didn't confuse consumers, that they actually, the more labels that was on the product that fit their views, the more likely they were to buy that item. So uh, it'll be, the, 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 the report hasn't been published yet, but when it is, I mean, I think it, it kind of challenges that notion that consumers can't figure it out. All right, I see Tia. Hi there. Um, I have two questions. Uh, so I'm with the, I'm the executive director of the Canada Organic Trade Association, and I have a background in fair trade for about 20 years, mm -hmm. working with Fair Trade Canada um, and Fair Trade International and Fair Trade America. Um, so I just have two questions, one of them being, I know that the logos that you've got in regards to the social welfare standards are not all the same, and it is quite, <laughs> quite confusing uh, for consumers. I'm just wondering if you guys have considered um, that these certification systems need to be a part of the ICL in order as a baseline, in order for them to be recognized, because that is the place where the credibility and, and the, the conformity happens amongst the ethical certification? Well, I take a stab at that. I, I think you're right. Uh, many of us spent a great deal of time trying to woo all of the different fair trade uh, claims into a room and lock the door and say, can't we agree like we have in organic on what is fair? And in the end, they said, hell no, we're going to go out and compete. <laughs> and that is a difficulty. Yeah. And having been involved in both of those movements, yeah. uh, at the juncture that we came to organic, we sought to build a partnership with government. They chose to stay private. They're having the same problems we're having, but we have the advantage of having a common standard. So we're able to have multi-ingredient products have an organic claim and it be able to flow across the planet. Fair trade in this juncture and the reason regenerative tried to raise the bar to the highest level was to try and actually force that community to raise their bar to a common level. Mm -hmm. And that will, for some of those labels, this will be very difficult because some of these labels that call themselves fair, it might only be fair for one segment of that supply chain. Maybe it's just the exchange between that farmer cooperative and the roaster. There's nothing about the worker, or there's nothing about the business having to pay a fair price. That for us, if we're talking about fairness, it's got to be across the whole system. We can't turn to farmers and say, you've got to pay your workers fairly and give them rights and all of this if they have none of those rights themselves. 
we must empower both of those if we are to make change because in the end of the day they're not actually opposite they're actually a team it's just that we have put that pressure on them to make it predatory yeah it's extremely ambitious what um, your goal is and that's my life's mission is to fair trade organic and organic fair trade so that's excellent work you're doing um, the other request I've got a request and then a question which is um, can we please include the Canada organic logo as the baseline um, also you've got the NOP criteria so please promote our logo <laughs> in Canada um, and then the second question is why on the animal welfare standards is organic certification not required um, as one of your criteria I see certified humane and other ones but not uh, organic certification did you hear that I can hear the last yeah, question my understanding, Tia, is that actually for the regenerative, I the livestock must be certified organic as well. Uh, that is required whether you are producing food or livestock, you must be certified organic as part of the baseline. Then on top of being certified organic, you must have the third party verified animal welfare uh, standard that could be through any number of providers that goes above and beyond the organic requirements. So it is actually right in there. You couldn't be regenerative organic certified beef without being organic in the first place. 